ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರಗಳು ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ವಿಜ್ಞಾನ ಮತ್ತು ತಂತ್ರಜ್ಞಾನ ಅಕಾಡೆಮಿ ಕಡೆಯಿಂದ ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ಸ್ವಾಗತ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ದಿ ನೊಬೆಲ್ ಲಾರಿಯೇಟ್ ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್ ಸೀರೀಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಟೂ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ತ್ರೀ ಡೇಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ದ ಥರ್ಡ್ ಸೀರೀಸ್ ದಟ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಹ್ಯಾವಿಂಗ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಟೂ ಡೇಸ್ ಅವರ್ ಕಲಿಂಗ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಫೋಕ್ ಆನ್ ನೊಬೆಲ್ ಲಾರಿಯೇಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಇನ್ ಫಿಸಿಯಾಲಜಿ ಆರ್ ಮೆಡಿಸಿನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕೆಮಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ Today we have the third talk in the series for the year 2022 on Nobel laureates for the subject Physics. Dr. Aspen Aspect, Dr. John F. Clauser and Dr. Anton Zeilinger for their experiments on entangled photons. To uh, give this uh, expert talk, we have with us Professor Urbashi Sinha. I cordially welcome you, Madam, and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. to speak on the nobel laureates of uh, for physics in the year 2022 among the audience we have uh, the esteemed member of the ksta dr professor basuras mulimani former vice chancellor of the kalbur university dr ram krishna former director of the botanical uh, uh, survey of india uh, and, and several others and uh, we also uh, would have this on the youtube so a large number of people uh, would watch uh these uh, presentations to be very briefly introducing professor urbashi sinha a professor at the raman research institute bangalore where she heads the quantum information and computing qic uh, laboratory she is a simon semi northern fellow at the perimeter institute canada as well as an associate uh, faculty member at the iqc university of waterloo canada and cqiqc university of toronto in canada Uh, professor uh, sinha completed her phd and msc in physics at cambridge university uk she was a gates uh, cambridge scholar during phd and a nehru shivling scholar during her masters she is a post doctoral uh, research associate in cavendish labs cambridge as well as the iqc canada the lab that she works in specializes in experiments on photonic quantum information processing and including the quantum computing and quantum communication you know you know that quantum is the new word in frontier sciences primarily using single and entangled photons and is leading india's first project in satellite based secure quantum communications professor sinha has uh, several recognitions including the 2017 homi baba fellowship 2018 ictpicu gallino denor the award in optics being recognized as one of the asia's top 100 scientists by the asian scientists for the year 2019 and the asocam women in cyber making a difference award in the category cyber leading from the front in 2021 so with this kind of credential credentials and her current engagement in the very subject that uh, the nobel prize has been awarded uh, we couldn't have had a better person than professor bashi sinha for uh, speaking on uh, the nobel laureates in physics 2022 with these words i thank you once again and welcome you for your talk professor sinha please thank you very much uh, for this very kind invitation and of course sinha would like to thank uh, the karnataka science and technology academy for you know hosting this very nice series and for inviting me uh, to present a talk here on the nobel prize in physics 2022 Uh, let me just share my screen before i uh, speak further and uh, also i would like a bit of reassurance from someone that uh, you can see my first slide yes we can thank see you. great thank you so thank you very much for the very kind introduction and of course i would say that you know um, this is uh, this year's nobel prize uh, to me has uh, you know a dual significance uh, the first significance is a bit personal and of course it was already referred to uh, in the in the introduction that you know this uh, the prize that has been given uh, actually is on an area which is where uh, you know i belong so i work in photonic quantum science and technologies and the kind of work the seminal work that has been done by these three legends in our field has in fact led to you know the you know the the, the explosive growth that we see now and and the kind of work that we are doing and you know uh, various new vistas that we are exploring because of the basis the foundation that this work has laid 
so me and my lab members and the entire community of you know photons i would say is extremely thrilled by this year's prize it was long awaited actually by many of us the second reason why i believe that this prize is particularly significant is because this is uh, uh, you know uh, the prize the, the way the citation reads in the in you know the uh, the novel uh, citation that has been given the prize actually recognizes not only the fundamental science contributions that of course uh, are very very special but it also recognizes the technological uh, you know ramifications that this prize has so the prize has been given not just for the science but also for the technology so it kind of reassures you and you know reaffirms your faith in contributing to fundamental science because that is the kind of thing which can lead to revolutionary technologies i'm sure the nobel laureates themselves uh, in the you know uh, as they proceeded with this series of astonishing experiments maybe did not realize the ramifications that their work would have in the technologies that form today's uh, century right so we call it the second quantum revolution and so we are all a part of it and for the next decades if not century we will see all this uh, grow into things which we perhaps even cannot imagine now but this is the imagination that it has kindled this year's nobel prize and so it is both uh, you know an ode to the science and the technology so with that i go on to the citation itself the nobel prize in physics 2022 has been awarded to alan aspe john f clauser and anton zeilinger and as you can see for experiments with entangled photons establishing the violation of bell inequalities and pioneering quantum information science so you know it is the whole package it is not just about the fundamental part but also the whole field of quantum information science which is very very technology oriented so this is the citation so what i want to do uh, you know over the next hour or so that i will be uh, speaking to you uh, uh, about this prize is that I, i know that we have a mixed audience so i will spend the first uh, you know uh, part of my talk in uh, discussing with you the concepts and, and uh, that we need to understand to a certain extent to understand the Uh, you know the import of this year's prize then i will go on to discussing the experiments because this prize is for experiments you know it is not just for enabling experiments for actually the experiments and so it's a journey you know it's it's a journey which is beautiful because you know how one experiment leads to the other and what it does to improve on the previous one it's it's fascinating not just for people like me who work with these things but but for anyone really so i will walk you through the various contributions which led to the prize and then talk about you know the technologies that already uh, one of them definitely started you know pioneered which is anton zeilinger but then moreover you know what it has led to in current times and what can happen as we see peak into the future uh, all the foundations being laid by this year's nobel prize so the first topic of course which we need to have a certain understanding of uh, you know in order to proceed meaningfully uh with uh you know appreciating uh this year's prize is of course the topic of uh, what is called entanglement okay so entanglement is something which i'm sure you know we hear about a lot even if you're not in the field it is definitely something which gets spoken about a lot written about a lot so in some sense it's become somewhat of a buzzword i would say but then what exactly is entanglement okay so this brings me to this very popular example which uh, uh you know embodies entanglement rather well Uh, which is what we call uh, the schrodinger cat paradox and in fact you know i'm sure some of you who may be watching sitcoms already see that this has pop- been popularized to the level that it appears in uh, television now it's a part of one of the important episodes of big bang theory so it is uh, you know very much in popular culture so what actually happens in the schrodinger cat paradox so here i have a cat okay uh, which is sitting inside a box which is opaque uh this cat uh, is uh, you know uh, inside so we can't really see it from outside but along with the cat there is also a you know a vial of uh, cyanide yeah that's of course an imaginary situation but it uh, is something which embodies this very well so there is a cat and there is a vial of cyanide so if the cat has the cyanide then of course you know it would die okay if it does not have the cyanide then it lives so then what happens is that when the cat has the cyanide it actually leads to the emission of an alpha particle or a radioactive particle from uh, the the box and if it does not have then there is no such emission okay so this is the situation so essentially this is the idea 
So if it has, does not have the cyanide, the particle remains in the box. If it has it, then there is a, a radioactive particle emitted. We can look at it this way now. So here we have this cat which is sitting inside the box. What is important is that the cat is inside the box, the poison is inside the box, so is the source of radioactive particles. From outside, we do not really know what is going on with the cat. So for us, it is in a superposition of being dead and alive at the same time, right? Because we don't know the state of the cat till we either see or not see this radioactive particle. So the state of the cat is correlated with the state of this radioactive particle. Right? So if the cat is inside the box and doesn't have the poison, then the particle, this radioactive particle remains inside the box. If the cat unfortunately has the poison, when it dies, then the radioactive particle comes out of the box. Okay? So this correlation that the cat and the state of the radioactive particle share defines this particular state now. Okay? So a live cat, particle in the box, dead cat, radioactive particle outside. And this is the kind of state which is uh, what we call an entangled state. Of course, you know, uh, this is uh, an example to motivate how entanglement works. If you want to really create entangled particles, then, you know, you have to do certain entangling operations. This is called the Hadamard, C0 gate, so on and so forth. But then the whole idea is that we have a pair of systems which share a certain correlation at birth. Okay. And even if these systems now, you know, get separated from each other, this correlation remains. This correlation, which is a quantum correlation, is what is called entanglement. Okay. In fact, I like this example very much of an orchestra. So here I have an orchestra, right? And so if I were to listen, you know, if I am a music lover and I want to listen to, you know, a Mozart symphony or, you know, a Beethoven symphony or something like that, I actually would like this entire orchestra to play together. So the, the pianist, the cellist, you know, all these uh, various instruments have to play in coordination for me to get this, uh, you know, beautiful uh, music in my, uh, you know, years and, and, you know, to enjoy this music. So, however, if I come up with a situation where only the pianist is playing or only the cellist is playing or only the, you know, uh, drummer or whatever, you know, the some other instrument is playing, it will be nice. I will be able to, you know, appreciate the music still, but it won't be the same as all of them playing together. Since all of them playing together brings about this, uh, you know, uh, moment which does not get captured by them playing individually. So whole is more than the sum of parts and that is what defines an entangled state. An entangled state, once two systems or more than two systems are entangled, this whole is more than the sum of parts. You cannot write it as a product anymore. And this is what, uh, you know, uh, uh, is a definition of an entangled state. So a, syst a system is entangled if it is not separable. So, you know, I have three or four slides which are a little bit, you know, which talk about the math a little bit so that, you know, even people who perhaps, you know, are a little more aware of this, they can catch on. But even for others to just have a feeling that, you know, it is not just about, of course, uh, you know, there is some math involved in what we do. And I have kept it to a minimum, but, you know, there will be a little bit of discussion there so that you can get this uh, more easily, uh, the contributions from this year's prize. So a system, uh, which is a two-party system, is said to be entangled if it cannot be written as a direct product of two states, okay, from the two subsystem Hilbert spaces, which is in other words saying that you can't write them anymore in a separable form. Now they are correlated, they will continue being correlated. You can't write it as a product. For instance, for pure entangled states, this is an example, okay. So this psi AB is a pure in two-party entangled state. You cannot write it as a product of the first system and the second system state. It has to be written together. And an example is what are called the Bell states, okay. So this 0, 0 plus 1, 1 or 0, 0 minus 1, 1, likewise this. These are four states which are called maximally entangled states. You cannot write them as a product of 0 and 1, uh, separately. It is 0, 0 plus 1, 1. You cannot decompose it into a product. Okay? So this is what is an entangled state and in fact this is a picture of an entangled photon source from our lab. Okay? So uh, here you can see that when, they pho when photons you know they are emitted uh, from an uh, you know entangled source they come out in the form of cones. Okay? So this left cone let's say is the state of the first photon. The right cone is the state of the second photon. 
However, when I talk about this intersection point, I do not know a priori which cone the photon belongs to. It could be either left or right. And that is where these intersection points represent the entangled states. So if the, you know, the left uh, photon is in state 0, then the right photon is in state 0. If the left photon is in state 1, right photon is in state 1 and so on. So you do not know which one it is, still you know the state of one of them. Okay? And so this, in, uh, this indistinguishability at the intersection is what is used uh, as an entangled state. So this is an example of how we create entangled photons in the lab. So this is the first topic which I wanted to discuss a little bit, which is entanglement. Okay? The next topic, which is, you know, a very important topic in, uh, in this uh, year's prize is, of course, what is locality? So this is something I'm sure you remember. You know, you must have uh, studied, uh, you know, many of you may have studied some course on uh, uh, special relativity and so on and so forth. So that form of locality, I think we are all kind of familiar with, which is, what is called Einstein's separability criteria or special relativistic locality. So this is what it represents, you know. So you have a, this is what, this is the time axis and this is the space, okay. So this is what is called a space-time diagram. Hmm? A space-time diagram models space on the x-axis and time on the y-axis, which is now known as, let's say, the t-axis. Often it is modeled in, you know, light units. So you make it ct so that the slope uh, becomes unity for something which is moving at the speed of light. So anything, okay, which is inside this cone uh, uh, will uh, be, you know, so when you're going up, this is what is called a time-like event. So any event which is within this cone are separated by time-like separation, we call it, because it is within this cone. But suppose you have an event which is outside this cone. So this event outside the cone is related to something within the cone by what is called space-like separation, which in other words means that you cannot send any signal from one point to the other faster than the speed of light okay so this is essentially what you know uh, uh, this uh, space time diagram captures that so if there is something within the cone something outside the cone you cannot have instantaneous signaling this is called no signaling condition and this is what is essentially special relativistic locality so something which is within the light cone events which are within the light cone are so called quote unquote local and events which are separated by one being within the light cone, one being within the uh, outside the light cone are non-local from the special relativistic perspective. Okay, So this is what is the uh, concept of no signaling. However, we have to remember and we will come to this later on that John Bell's locality assumption is actually stronger than this. So this is Einstein, this is the special relativistic locality but we will see where his locality assumption involves something more and we will get to it as we talk through the various um, experiments. Okay? So then it brings me to the third point which is in fact asking you some fundamental quantum questions. Okay? So this is a question which I am sure you all worry about or wonder about. Uh, you know people who are not from the field specifically would wonder about this that you know we hear about these various aspects of quantum mechanics already you have heard now in this lecture on entanglement and you know, uh, locality, uh, and, and I hope you have understood some of it, but still, you know, these concepts don't seem uh, as, uh, you know, intuitive to our mind, because we are all in a classical world in some sense. So these non-classical features of quantum mechanics, you know, what do they reveal about the physical, uh, nature of physical reality? How to reconcile our everyday experience of the macroscopic world, yeah, that is what we live in, with the quote-unquote weird behavior of the microphysical world, described by quantum mechanics. These are questions I'm sure we all wonder about. So to what extent is it possible to test quantum mechanics in the macro limit? This brings us to the third concept we need to understand, which is called realism. Okay? So the classical realist worldview states that a system is in a definite state for which all its observable properties have definite values independent of measurement. Okay? Which means, for instance, that you know some of you may be sitting in a chair and listening to my lecture. If I look the other side, which I have just done, maybe you still continue sitting in the chair and listening to my lecture. So the, your property of being seated in that chair is independent of where I am looking. My looking here is mimicking measurement. So your property is independent of what I am doing as an act of measurement. 
which is what makes sense to us. The tree outside is there, even if I'm not looking outside the window at this very moment. However, unlike a classical state, the specification of a quantum state does not in general give the values of dynamical variables possessed by a system. Thus, in general, a dynamical variable is taken to have no definite measurement independent value. This is very counterintuitive if you think about it. So only when you measure, you know. Essentially, a measurement according to quantum mechanics in general does not reveal a pre-existent value of a dynamical variable. Okay? So this is what it means. This is realism. So if there was a pre-existent value of a dynamical variable, that is what we would call realism. Quantum mechanics, on the other hand, does not reveal a pre-existent value. So quantum mechanics actually uh, violates realism. Okay? So this brings us to this famous quote by Albert Einstein that, you know, I like to think the moon is there even if I'm not looking at it, which is what, you know, is the concept of realism, that the moon is there irrespective of my act of looking. So indeed, you know, stalwarts like Einstein and others were puzzled by this, that, you know, in quantum mechanics, this seems to break down. However, this is what we will see, you know, the, as you have read in the abstract, this year's Nobel Prize has been given for experiments in entanglement and violation of Bell inequalities. So violation of Bell inequalities actually violates what we call local realism. So locality and realism put together. So indeed, quantum mechanics violates realism. Okay? And so it is uh, counterintuitive, but that is what these experiments are all about. Yeah? This brings us to, of course, the final topic, which is the topic of all these experiments, Bell inequality. Right? So this is John Bell, by the way. And this is a beautiful article that Bell has written on Bodelman socks and the nature of reality. I would encourage uh, students and any other interested, uh, you know, uh, audience member to read this article because it's beautifully written and it does capture uh, the whole thing in a, you know, not very mathematical way. Okay. So here Bell says, okay, the philosopher in the street who has not suffered a course in quantum mechanics, mark my words, he says suffer, is quite unimpressed by einstein podolsky rosen correlations. So he can point to many examples of similar correlations in everyday life. As you know, these einstein podolsky rosen correlations are the ones which kind of, uh, it's the Gedanken experiment, whereby, EP, uh, I, and as we call them, EPR, they showed that, uh, you know, quantum mechanics uh, does violate um, uh, realism, right? So he says that, you know, he can point to many examples of similar correlations in everyday life. The case of Bertelmann's socks is often cited. So this is a friend and colleague of John Bell, Dr. Bertelmann, who likes to wear two socks of different colors. Okay. So which color he will have on a given foot on a given day is quite unpredictable. So you can see this is John Bell's figure, you know, uh, uh, where he says, you know, the first sock, if it is pink, you can already be sure that the second sock will not be pink. So observation of the first and experience of Bertelmann, you already know that Bertelmann does not wear matched socks. So observation of the first, if it turns out to be being pink and your experience of Bertelmann gives immediate information about the second, you know it is not pink. There is no accounting for taste, but ap apart from that, there is no mystery here. So this is what John Bell says, that why is this EPR business uh, being taken so, in a, you know, why is this leading to so much confusion? Because we are talking about a pair of correlated photons. Isn't it similar to this pair of correlated socks? Okay. So this is a question he asks. Of course, we, we know the answer is not that. Uh, it is not similar to a pair of correlated socks because here we are talking about a pair of particles which share a correlation at birth, which, you know, they continue sharing even when they are separated uh, far from each other as opposed to this, which is not, uh, you know, due to any quantum correlation. This is just, you know, uh, 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 a pair of socks, which has no correlation per se, other than, you know, because you have this knowledge, you can claim uh, that one is pink and the other is not pink. And this is, in fact, uh, Reinhold Bertelmann showing his socks in Vienna, okay? Uh, and indeed, he continues to wear mismatched socks. So the best known set of experiments which examine this question of realism are those which stem from the theoretical work of Einstein et al. and of Bell and are called this EPR Bell experiments, right? So they refer to measurements made on a pair of systems which have interacted in the past but are now separated to a distance such that according to the postulates of special relativity, the outcome of a measurement as one system cannot be causally influenced by the choice of what to measure the other, right? So this is an example of, you know, uh, this famous Bell inequality. We will, of course, 
We will study a little more on this during this talk. This is a source of uh, you know, entangled photons. One of the photons is sent to one direction, the other is sent to the other direction and you measure certain correlations and in fact this is the uh, kind of correlation and we will come across this again during the talk. So this is the correlation which is in fact called the Bell inequalities and uh, this is one form of the Bell inequality which is violated uh, by quantum mechanics. Okay. But uh, this is something I want to discuss and before I go on to that, I want to just read, you know, Bertelmann's comment here. He says that, you know, when he derived Bell's inequality for the first time, he was really impressed that it was possible to, dis, uh, you know, discriminate between what is called these hidden variable theories and quantum mechanics. And he wondered, you know, how John Bell actually found this special combination of expectation values. Because as a theorist, the job was done. But of course, if, you know, you have to do experiments to figure out what nature is all about. Just doing the theory is not enough. So John Bell, of course, laid down the theory, but it is the experiments which make this, uh, you know, uh, come through in terms of what nature does, right? And so this uh, is then, you know, uh, uh, I have a few slides here on, uh, to motivate to you what are Bell inequalities, because after all, the rest of the talk will be spent in telling you how they were violated, right? So we have our two quintessential characters, Alice and Bob. Let's call them A and B. Alice actually chooses to perform one of two possible measurements, okay, A0 or A1, okay. Likewise, Bob also chooses between two binary measurements, binary measurements uh, B0 or B1. So, Bob's is B0 or B1, Alice A0, A1, Bob's B0, B1. Uh, the result of Alice's measurement A0 can be either plus 1 or minus 1. That's why it's binary, it is either of these two values. So, A0 can be plus 1 or minus 1. A1 also plus 1 or minus 1, likewise for Bob. Okay, so A0, A1, B0, B1 can have a possibility of being either plus 1 or minus 1 and Alice and Bob choose to perform one of them randomly. There are two assumptions in this. Each measurement revealed a property that the particle already possessed independent of being observed or measured, which is realism, okay, which we just discussed. And Alice's choice of action cannot influence Bob's result or vice versa, which is locality. So by doing these two assumptions, we can then derive Bell's, equal, Bell's inequality, okay. Example, Alice chooses to measure A0, okay, and obtains the result, uh, let's say plus 1. Then the particle she received carries the value of plus 1 for the property small a0, right, because you have to, of course, the property will be uh, a different variable, the measured quantity is a0. So choose the following, consider the following combination, okay, A0, B0 plus A0, B1 plus A1, B0 minus A1, B1. So these are all possible combinations that can happen with Alice and Bob's choice, okay. So if I rearrange, I can do A0 plus A1 times B0 plus A0 minus A1 times B1, right. Now, either A0 equal to A1 or A0 equal to minus A1, right, because it's only plus or minus 1. Because if you remember, A0 is either plus or minus 1, similarly A1 is plus or minus 1. So these are the only two possibilities. So you can see that from 1, either A0 plus A1 will be 0 when A0 equal to minus A1. And if A0 equal to A1, this term will be 0. So either of the terms will be 0 for one of these possibilities, right. The other term will then evaluate to plus minus 2 because it's uh, going between minus 1 and plus, uh, minus 1, so it's minus 1, my, uh, 0 and plus 1, these are the possibilities. So experiment is repeated over many trials with new pairs of particles, average over many trials for the combination, A0, B0, this combination that we discussed will be then less than equal to 2 because the maximum value is 2, right. No single trial can measure the quantity because Alice and Bob choose one measurement each at a time, right, so it's always an average. But on the assumption, this is that realism assumption that underlying properties exist, average of sum equal to sum of averages. Because the underlying properties exist, it's not going to change whether you do an average of sum or sum of averages. So this is what it means. Now we do the sum of averages for these, um, uh, you know, measured quantities. So this sum, you know, A0, B0, expectation of A0, B0 plus, etc. minus this is less than equal to 2. This is what is called the CHSH form of Bell inequality. So uh, these are four gentlemen. So C actually is Clauser, one of the Nobel laureates this year. So this is the Bell inequality. Now what happens in quantum mechanics is of course the question. 
you have this bell state which we encountered earlier. Alice's measurements, you know, we are choosing measurements so that we can have a maximum violation. So Alice chooses to measure between the, uh, you know, she chooses to measure what is called the Pauli X, Bob, uh, Pauli X or Pauli Z. Bob measures in this diagonal basis, okay. Then quant and I won't go through the math here. You can work it out if you're interested. But if you choose these set of measurements and the quantum expectation values of pairs of these observables using Born's rule will be 1 by root 2 each, okay. And so this then turns out to be 2 root 2. So this is the maximum violation. So you know that, you know, anything between 2 and 2 root 2 is what quantum mechanics predicts and the maximum violation being 2 root 2. So this is where this 2 root 2 comes from, which is what we see has been violated by many of these experiments, which leads me to the topic of the experiments that led to the Nobel Prize. Okay. So the first experiment was done by, this is John Clauser and Stuart Friedman. And this was the paper they published in 1972, Experimental Test of Local Hidden Variable Theories. Now, this is a very interesting uh, story behind this. John Clauser actually did his PhD in astrophysics. Okay. And so when he moved to University of California, Berkeley, uh, he had started taking a keen interest in foundations of quantum mechanics. And he knew that, you know, there was uh, uh, an experiment that already existed from Koch and Comins. Uh, which was on producing pairs of particles which share some correlation. Okay? So it was in his mind that he wanted to use that setup to see if he could do a Bell inequality violation experiment, which had never been done before. But when he reached uh, the university, he was of course hired by someone called Charles Towns, who is a very well-known radio astronomy researcher. So he wanted Clauser to work on radio astronomy. But Clauser, you know, wanted to work on uh, this Bell inequality experiment. So he then managed to convince Charles Towns that, you know, this is also something he really needs to do. And then they came up with a compromise. Charles Towns talked to Cummins, who was, uh, you know, Cocker's uh, supervisor. Cocker had finished his PhD and left by then. That, you know, there is this experiment that uh, your lab has done. So his postdoc, John Clauser, wants to work on that experiment uh, for doing this Bell inequality violation. And then Cummins said, okay, that I'll only allow if my PhD student, Stuart Friedman, is also allowed to work with Clauser. And so that is how John Clauser and Friedman collaborated to work on this experiment. This was half of John Clauser's time because the other half he was working on astrophysics. Okay? And that is how he did this first experiment on Bell inequality violation. So what are the assumptions in his experiment? The two photons, they propagate as separated localized particles. Okay? This is one. A binary selection process occurs okay, for each photon at each polarizer. So this is important that it's either transmission or no transmission. Nothing else is allowed. This selection does not depend on the orientation of the distant polarizer. Now all photons incident on a detector have a probability of detection that is independent of whether or not the photon has passed through a polarizer. Right? So this was their experiment. It was done using calcium, uh, you know. Uh, this is, you can see this, the calcium atom. So resonance absorption of this photon uh, leads to, you know, this of the atoms that did not decay directly to the ground state, about 7% decayed to this one. And then in a cascaded way, it decayed to the ground state, giving rise to two photons, gamma 1 and gamma 2, at 5513 angstrom and 4227 angstrom. And these are the ones which are the correlated photons. Okay. So this was their experimental schematic. So, you know, uh, you can see that they had this, um, uh, uh, you know, photons being generated. These photons were going to two different polarizers and, you know, detectors and coincidence logic setup and so on in order to uh, measure these correlations, right? So, what about the experimental ingenuities and conclusions from this? The requirement for large efficient linear polarizers led them to employ what is called pile of plates polarizer. So, each polarizer consisted of 10.3 millimeter thick glass sheets inclined nearly at Brewster's angle. They wanted to have this uh, higher efficiency than what was possible. So they used this design. Okay. This was the inequality that they worked on. And as, as, as uh, you know, you probably already know, there are different forms of Bell inequalities. Depending on your experimental setup, you can kind of come up with the right form that you are measuring. This was the form that they worked on. Less than or equal to zero uh, is what local realism would suggest. And violation would be greater than zero. And cycling and averaging procedure was minimized and it minimized the effects of drift and apparatus asymmetry. And the results of measurements of the correlation, this R5 by R0, corresponding to a total integration time of 200 hours. Okay? And this is what is shown here. So you can see this coincidence rate 
uh, between uh, with angle phi between the polarizers how it is you know dropping as a function of this angle and uh, you know all error limits are conservative estimates of one standard deviation and so using the values of 22.5 and 67.5 that is the maximum violation you op they obtain delta 0 0.050 plus minus 0 0.008 which is in clear violation of the above inequality and so this is the graph as a function of different angles but for these two angles you get the maximum violation okay furthermore no evidence for a deviation from the predictions of quantum mechanics calculated from the measured polarizer efficiencies and solid angles so this is strong evidence against local hidden variable theories okay this was the first experiment now going on to the second experiment where alan aspey enters the game this is alan aspey and this is philip grangia i did not find a picture of gerard roger actually on the internet but he also participated in this this was uh, i would say the second main uh, just you know this is the experiment and it's a series of experiments that alana spey and collaborators did uh, which contributed to further improve upon the clauser result okay so what actually happened here again they used the same cascade in calcium but you know instead of using that probabilistic process they actually used you know the calcium atoms they are selectively pumped to the upper level and then they are using this cascade so there you saw that it was a an absorption which led to a probabilistic procedure here they actually uh, used a different technique where they pumped it and then they got these two photons this is their arrangement and you know again you have polarizers you have coincidence logic you have detectors also have a multi channel analyzer here what were their experimental ingenuities and conclusions so this again was the inequality that they worked on okay their experimental violation was 5.72 plus or minus uh, times 10 to the minus 2 plus or minus 0.343 times 10 to the minus 2. This is more than 13 standard deviations. Okay, So this is a much stronger violation. It's more than 13 standard deviations and in perfect agreement with quantum mechanical prediction as well. So this was their R5 by R0 graph. The other thing they did is they moved each polarizer away from the source, uh, 6.5 meters each away from the source. So to four coherence lengths of the wave packet associated with the lifetime of the intermediate state of the cascade, no change in results was observed. This is the first time they, somebody tried to actually make them, you know, far apart, so to speak. Not that far, but quite far so that it was beyond the coherence length. And the results are in excellent agreement with quantum mechanical predictions to a high statistical accuracy, a strong evidence against the whole class of realistic local theories. Okay. And also the important thing here is no effect of distance between measurements on the correlation was observed. This was their uh, contribution, first contribution. Then came this, you know, not first, I mean, I would say the, uh, the this is the second contribution from the same group, Alan Aspey and his collaborators, where actually they did something very interesting. So now, the, all these experiments are motivated by this EPR Gedanken experiment, which we saw there is a source, it gives rise to a pair of photons and you perform these joint measurements and you uh, motivate this correlation and you see whether it is violated or not. This is the correlation that EPR had in mind, right? P plus plus AB plus P minus minus AB minus P plus minus AB minus P minus plus AB. So there are four such set of joint probabilities and this is the derivation that we saw. Right? So this minus 2 less than equal to s less than equal to 2 where s is what is called the bell parameter. So this is the original uh, you know, sort of motivation where you have all these possibilities happen. That was EPR's intention but the experiments so far did not quite do that. The experiments till then including Alan Aspey's own experiment did not follow the scheme of this figure 1 closely enough. Some experiments were performed with pairs of you know, low energy photons emitted in atomic radiative cascades which we just saw. Uh, all previous experiments, they involved single channel analyzers, okay, not a true polarizer. So, transmitting one photon and block, uh, polarization blocking the other. So, only one thing uh, they could measure, which is in fact this one. So, they could only measure R plus plus AB. The other possibilities they could not measure um, in the same way. They had to do other tricks and treats, which we will come to. So, moreover, the previous experiments, you know, they use PMTs. They have of course, low efficiency detection system. So, measurement of the polarizations are inherently incomplete because you see, if no count is obtained at the PMT, it could be because of low detector efficiency or because it has been blocked by a polarizer. So, the latter is what we call the real polarization measurement. But then, you know, there was no way the previous experiments could have distinguished between these two. 
these type of uh, correlations could not be measured directly. Auxiliary measurements were required. Okay? So then you obtain these operational inequalities with further assumptions. That is what leads to these ingenuities of this experiment, where you know the experiment follows much more closely the PR Gedanken experiment. True dichotomic polarization measurements on visible photons were performed okay, by replacing polarizers by two channel polarizers separating two orthogonal linear polarization followed by two PMTs. Here in the, pre in the first one you had only one you know uh, transmission and um, blocking but here you are allowing for two channels. So in fact you will have four detectors overall. So first time polarizing beam splitters are introduced into Bill inequality experiments which we now take for granted right. So each polarizer is mounted in a rotatable mechanism holding two PMTs. This ensemble is called a polarimeter. This makes it very similar to the usual stern gulash measurements for spin half particles. So this is what happened. So as you can see, now you have two uh, polarization measurements, two on each side. So you measure the single photons and you also measure the coincidences. So instead of just one or the other, you have two and two on each side. So all those uh, things which you could not measure earlier could be done. So four-fold coincidence technique was used and the four coincidences are measured in a single run. This is a big achievement. This was the, you know, the relation and so this can, of course, it was repeated for three other choices of orientation and this earlier S parameter was used directly as a test of local realism. So this was their experimental result and this is the quantum mechanical result. As you can see, it's a beautiful match yet again. Okay? And this is the curve of E as a function of theta again for different choices of the, wave, of the polarizer angle. So uh, essentially this is the strongest violations of Bell inequalities ever achieved till date, till then, an excellent agreement with quantum mechanics, straightforward transpositions of the ideal EPR scheme, procedure is simple and needs no auxiliary measurements unlike previous experiments. However, of course there is a caveat because how, otherwise how would we go on to the next part of the story. So as you can see this is a beautiful story in the making, right? So there is an experiment which achieves something. But then there are some things which need to be improved. Then comes along another seminal experiment which does something uh, revolutionary and achieves that. But then again, there are still certain things left to be done, which leads to the caveat in this experiment, the assumption that the ensemble of actually detected pairs is a faithful sample of all emitted pairs. Now, this is what is called the fair sampling loophole. This is something, uh, this assumption need not be true, right? While care is taken to ensure that conditions are similar, this still remains a loophole. That you know, you can only detect a part of the photons that are getting uh, to your detector because detectors are not 100% efficient. What about that other part which does not get detected? Suppose they have a conspiracy and uh, end up not violating Bell inequality. So that loophole remains. So two main loopholes remain at this stage of the story. One is this above detection efficiency or fair sampling loophole and the other is static char a character of all previous experiments. So let's come to this static character part now, which brings us to the third main experiment from Alana Space Group, which is the experimental test of inequality, Wells inequalities using time varying analyzers. So getting rid of this static character. So what is this static character? This brings us to a very important slide. You know, I have told you earlier that we talked about special relativistic locality which meant that you know you can't have faster than light communication in the spirit of you know uh, uh, cause and effect right but bell's uh, locality condition was stronger than that so bell's strong locality condition and why experiments so far are inadequate is what we need to understand now all experiments so far that we have been discussing have been performed with static you know um, this uh, settings in which polarizers are held fixed for the whole duration of time. So you fix a polarizer and then you do the measurement. Again, you fix it to some other uh, angle, you do the measurement. There is uh, no, you know, so basically you're prefixing and doing the measurement. One may then question Bell's locality assumption that states that the results of the measurement of polarizer two does not depend on the orientation of polarizer one and vice versa, right? Nor does the way in which pairs are emitted depend on A and B. So if the polarizer two is already prefixed, then how do you know that it does not influence the orientation of the other polarizer. This may be reasonable, but such a locality condition is not prescribed by any fundamental law. Bell himself points out, okay, the settings of the instruments are made sufficiently in advance to allow them to reach some mutual rapport 
okay so before you start the main experiment you know uh, you can have some discussions with each other by exchanging signals with velocity less than or equal to speed of light and kind of come up with a recipe that okay this turn will uh, correspond to this result and this turn will correspond to this result if you have such a recipe then you can actually break this locality assumption that the settings on one side do not affect the results on the other so you have to bring in you know uh, dynamic experiments right locality condition would no longer hold for static experiments nor would bell inequalities bell thus insisted on the importance of experiments in which settings are changed during the flight of the particles and the current aspe paper reports the results of the first experiment using variable polarizers this was an ex ex extremely important uh, contribution right experimental ingenuity and so this is how it looks so as you can see you have the source again you know this part is now familiar to you but the important thing is that here they have an optical switch which randomly switches between you know one setting and the other so it's not like a prefix thing anymore there is a switching mechanism involved okay and this is where he gave the idea and this is the optical switch which is you uh, you know basically uh, using the concept of an acousto optic modulator so you have a light it is switched at a frequency of around 50 megahertz by diffraction at the brad angle on an ultrasonic standing wave so essentially uh, the light then interacts with this uh, transducer and then it is either undeflected or it gets deflected so this is a switching mechanism which can be done by uh, acoustic optic modulation okay so the switching of light is affected by acoustic optical interaction with an ultrasonic standing wave in water so standing wave in water it is vibrating at ultrasonic frequency the light comes in and has an interaction either it goes straight through or it gets deflected and so this experiment switching occurs at the time scale of 10 nanosecond and this is in as you can see uh, this this is um, uh, as the lifetime of the intermediate level is 5 nanosecond and it is this 10 nanosecond is also small compared to l by c which is 40 nanosecond so already it tells you that the switching is faster than what would be required for you know this sort of um, transfer of information let's say uh, even for things which are so our detection on one side and the corresponding change of orientation on the other side are separated by a space like interval right six meter from the source each switch is so rather complicated optics required to match the beams and so on and this is their curve okay so having said that what next so this was a tremendous achievement to be able to bring about this uh, dynamic character to uh, bring about this switching that actually you know to some extent address this uh, locality loophole then what next the new feature of this experiment is that the settings of the polarizers are changed at a greater speed than c by l right um, at a rate greater than c by l. so however the uh, ideal scheme is not completed okay since the change is not truly random but rather quasi periodic so it's still going from one to the other although it is going from one to the other it is somewhat periodic it is not quite generated by some random number generator or something it's still quasi periodic the switches on the two sides are driven by different generators at different frequencies thus natural to assume that they function in an uncorrelated way however a more ideal experiment with random and complete switching would be necessary for a fully conclusive argument and the next work reports this ideal experiment this next work was done by anton zeilinger and his uh, students and colleagues at that time so this is on violation of bell's inequality under strict einstein locality conditions as i have highlighted here the necessary space like separation of the observ observations is achieved by sufficient physical distance between the measurement stations by ultra fast and random setting of the analyzers which wasn't there before and by completely independent data registration also not there before two very important achievements which make this a seminal work uh, which actually comprehensively closes this locality loophole okay so what is needed to close the locality loophole so aspe et al you know they use this periodic sinusoidal switching which is predictable into the future thus communication slower than the speed of light or even speed of light could in principle explain the results obtained therefore this loophole was still open before zeilinger stepped into the game the individual measurement processes of the two observers then should be space like separated this zeilinger paper defines an individual measurement to last from the first point in time which can influence the choice of the analyzer setting until the final registration of the photon so the entire thing is taken to be the measurement time okay so that is individual measurements so quick that is impossible for any information about it 
to travel via any channel to the other observer before he in turn finishes his measurement. So this quick, uh, you know, and random uh, measurement choice is absolutely necessary. Okay. Section, selection of analyzer direction has to be completely unpredictable. So need for a physical random number generator. Pseudo random number generator cannot be used since its state at any time is predetermined. Okay. So this is what they did. So to achieve complete independence of both observers, one should avoid any common context as would be conventional registration of coincidences in all. So you saw coincidences were being registered in all previous experiments. Here what they did, the individual is, uh, events, they are registered on both sides independently and then compared only after the measurements are finished. So then there is complete independence. This requires independent and highly accurate time basis on both sides. These are the two main achievements. This random switching using a physical random number generator and highly independent uh, and accurate time basis on both sides. And so this was their experimental setup. Okay, So this is the source. As you can see, this is what they define as their measurement time. And so Alice is here and Bob is obviously space-like separated. Okay, uh, And so coming to these ingen ingenuities and conclusions, in this experiment for the first time, any mutual influ influence between the two observations is excluded with the realm of Einstein locality. The two observers are spatially separated by 400 meters across the Innsbruck University campus. Okay, So individual measurements as defined earlier have to be shorter than 1.3 microsecond for it to be slower than speed of light, the time for direct communication and speed of light. So the duration of individual measurement was kept far below 1.3 microsecond using high speed physical random number generators and fast electro-optic modulators and this you should remember for the last part of my story where I will tell you how all this is being used uh, uh, you know as commonplace in modern technology and it is leading to such beautiful ramifications. Independent data registration was performed by each observer having his own time interval analyzer and atomic clock okay synchronized only once before once before each experiment cycle source of photon pairs was degenerate type 2 SPDC the kind we use in the lab now not uh, calcium cascade and silicon APDs and not PMTs with the you know APDs have low dark count rate low noise that is those were they were used and you know it's much smaller than compared to the 10,000 to 15,000 signal photons that they so lots of uh, you know technical achievements which made this extremely important physics goal achievable which is uh, you know no mutual influence uh, completely closing the locality loophole this is how the experiment looks and this is their results, of course, you know, by now you're familiar with these curves. So this corresponds to a violation of the CHSH inequality of 30 standard deviations, assuming only statistical errors. So this is uh, important. Then comes the final part. So which major loopholes now need to be closed? Fair sampling loophole, of course. We discussed there was the static time loophole and then there was the fair sampling loophole, which is about detectors not being 100% efficient. In fact, Bell himself says, okay, it is hard for me to believe that quantum mechanics works so nicely for inefficient practical setups and is yet going to fail badly when sufficient ref refinements are made. Like when you have better detectors, suddenly quantum mechanics will fail, he doesn't think so. So of more importance, according to his opinion, is the complete absence of the vital time factor in existing experiments. The analyzers are not rotated during the flight of the particles. So this Zeilinger experiment closes the timing or locality loophole but not yet loophole free uh, till, of course, the next experiment. So this is again Anton Zeilinger with many collaborators where he performs the first significant loophole free test of Bell's theorem with entangled photons. So, you know, this is a very important achievement using a well-optimized source of entangled photons, rapid setting generation and highly efficient superconducting detectors. They observe, observe, observe a violation of Bell inequality with high statistical significance. Okay, and 11.5 standard deviation. So locality and detection loophole closed simultaneously for the first time and making uh, a first, uh, you know, this is then the first loophole free Bell inequality experiment. Okay, so all this, of course, has contributed to his Nobel Prize. This is the timeline. You see 1935 EPR raised this question. John Bell came up with Bell inequality 1964. 2022, uh, we have the Nobel Prize in physics and Anton Zeilinger's uh, loophole free bell experiment is in the 2015 to 2017 time frame. So you see how many decades it took to reach this loophole free violation of bell inequality. Why is a loophole free test so important? 
you know, of course, it is beautiful because, you know, it tells you that quantum mechanics, you know, agrees with what you're doing. You know, you have, it's a verification, strong violation of local realism, all that is okay. But then the applications are what makes it important. Applications include perfectly secure quantum key distribution and unhackable sources of truly random numbers, okay, for instance. So this is summarized in this. Please do have a look. And uh, to understand the importance of a loophole free test because when you, once you do a loophole free test then you know that there is no alternative explanation to what you are proposing and that means that you can use this for technology for instance secure quantum communications otherwise you cannot use it without thinking that okay maybe there is still some uh, loophole that needs to be closed and my application is not perfectly secure loophole free is thus important and which brings us to this experiment that we have done earlier this year which is a loophole free interferometric test of macro realism using heralded single photons and this in fact is the first ever loophole free violation of what is called the legged garg inequalities we are talking about bell inequalities so far the legged garg inequalities proposed by nobel laureate sir anthony leggett and anupam garg are the time equivalent of the bell inequalities so the time correlated version and this has been achieved by our lab in early 2022. It's indeed a proud moment for our lab because this is the year in which the loophole-free Bell inequalities have been honored so beautifully. So uh, we are very happy that we have performed the first loophole-free violation of the legged guard inequalities. This also has been going on for several decades and we have been able to crack this problem. With that, I want to you know, read out a little bit from this uh, citation from the Royal Sw Swedish Academy of Sciences. Because the last 10 minutes of my talk, I want to spend on the technology. So this year's Nobel Prize is a beautiful example of research in fundamental science having astonishing technological ramifications. As you can see from this citation that they have uh, you know, posted, the Bell inequalities are not just a matter of quantum mechanical ontology, but can be put to practical use. You know, we, in this context, the return to the different loopholes is Clauser's original experiment. There is locality loophole. Then there is the closing of the uh, all the loopholes and so on, which was managed by Zeilinger. So Clauser and Aspe, Aspe closed the locality and Zeilinger closed both. The main importance of these results is not to once again confirm that quantum mechanics is correct. That's fine. But rather to enable even more secure QKD protocols. Since these depend on Bell tests, the issue here is not whether nature conspires to violate Bell inequalities, but whether the evil eavesdropper Eve does. Okay? And so in 2022, three groups, you know, they use loophole-free Bell tests to experimentally realize device-independent quantum key distribution protocols. This means that the key is secure even if Eve has access to the quantum hardware that runs the distribution. Okay? So this was possible because of this Nobel Prize winning work. So um, the, all the technologies we see around us in quantum communications and quantum technologies, a lot of it owes itself to uh, you know, what these uh, gentlemen have achieved along with their uh, several colleagues. Okay? It's this astonishing technological ramification which I want to discuss with you over the next few slides. But before we go on to understanding how this year's Nobel Prize winning work enabled secure quantum communications. You, do you remember this fast switching that was used in the Zeilinger experiment? I told you to remember this, that this fast switching will come back. Now it is used in QKD, you know, quantum key distribution all the time. All these are examples of papers uh, where, you know, people are using fast, uh, you know, switching uh, to achieve this uh, high level of security. The security is possible because of this kind of switching and because of uh, uh, this technology which uh, at that time was done to show a Bell inequality violation. However, what the uh, Nobel Prize actually enables is what we call the global quantum communication network. What it enables is the possibility of having secure communication across the globe by using fiber networks, by using satellite based networks, by using entanglement based quantum teleportation, quantum relay, quantum repeater, free space communication using satellites, all this is possible because of these experiments on entanglement and Bell inequality violation uh, that were done by this year's Nobel laureates. Okay? This is the snapshot of the various kinds of distances we can reach by using different kinds of technologies, whether trusted nodes, whether satellites, whether repeaters with quantum memories and so on. Okay? So now, this is again, so Zeilinger did not get the Nobel Prize just for the loophole free violation of Bell inequalities. In fact, he also got it for the first demonstration of experimental quantum teleportation. Okay, and this is, a, these are his colleagues, John Wei Pan and Dick, uh, Dirk uh, Baumister. 
Okay, so and others who have performed this first experimental quantum teleportation. This is the paper which proposed and, and derived quantum teleportation by Charles Bennett et al. And this is teleportation. I won't go through the math here, but the general idea is that quantum teleportation is a quantum communication protocol where you can use an entangled source as a resource to send information about a quantum state from one party to another who may be separated by thousands of kilometers, uh, you know, uh, by just using this entanglement. Okay? So this is a means of quantum communication, not necessarily for quantum key distribution, but for sending information. So it's an information transfer protocol. Okay? And so now you can see all these new results in experimental free space quantum teleportation, for instance. This was by John Wei Pan's group, where they demonstrated this over 16 kilometers. Then there is Anton Zeilinger himself along with others who have done this for 143 kilometers using some new technique. So these are all new results, latest results and there are many more that will be achieved over the next decades or century building on these ideas. Okay? So this is the ground to satellite quantum teleportation. This is chip to chip quantum teleportation. It's happening in different domains. So it's a very vibrant field, quantum teleportation. And Anton Zeilinger's part of his Nobel Prize is for the first quantum teleportation experiment. And he continues to do recent ones, you know, seminal ones even now. This is another reason why he was given the Nobel Prize, which was to enable yet another way of quantum communication, which is called entanglement swapping. And again, John Wei Pan is involved. And in fact, John Wei Pan is another very, very prolific researcher in this field. He's from China, has demonstrated satellite-based quantum communication, for instance, uh, and has worked closely with Zeilinger over the years. And so entanglement swapping is the, another technolo technological reason why Anton Zeilinger was given the Nobel Prize. So what is entanglement swapping? Let me take you back to your childhood where you may have participated in relay races, right? So you have these two teams. There's one person carrying a baton, takes it over to the person in the other, on the other side. The baton is then passed over to a second person. He or she runs over this side and so on. So this is, this is what is called a relay. So you keep passing the baton. And then uh, at some point it stops. So this is what is used in swapping entanglement as well. Here I have an entangled photon source. Here I have a different entangled photon source. One and two are entangled here. Three and four are entangled here. But what I want to do is swap the entanglement between one, two and three, four to one and four, which are now separated by a larger distance. So we do what is called a Bell state measurement, which results in the entanglement now getting uh, swapped to one and two. This is entanglement swapping and this is what leads to quantum relays and, uh, and can lead to distribution of entanglement over long distances, which again is a means of quantum communication. And of course, you know, beyond the point, you need to store the information. That is where quantum memory comes in. So once you have a relay and a memory, together you form a quantum repeater, which is a very, very vibrant field of research. As you can see, these are all experiments in recent times on swapping and teleportation. Uh, and, and many things. This is 2022, for instance, right? So this is the state of art in quantum memories towards quantum repeaters. So these are, again, Jan Wei Pan uh, leads uh, one of these efforts, entanglement of two quantum memories via fibers over dozens of kilometers. This is, you know, a 12.5 kilometer, again, between two atomic ensembles, 33 kilometer Harold Wine photo group. So very active. And, you know, ultimately, we want to see all this getting connected to this global quantum communication network or the quantum internet. It also leads to what is called device independent quantum key distribution, where entanglement is a necessary requirement. And these are all latest results where people have sh you know, shown uh, different versions of this DI QKD. Another area which is flourishing is device independent random number generation. These are, uh, you know, uh, this is the first uh, paper which proposed, again, Bell inequality violation is used as a source of uncrackable random numbers. Okay? And this is the experiment which first showed that this is possible and there are follow-ups and there is a lot to do. Our lab is working on different projects in device independent quantum uh, random number generation as well. Okay? This brings us to satellite-based secure quantum communication. This is the general idea. You know, if you want to have quantum communications, you want to have it over a long distance. You can't go too far with the fiber because then, you know, you can't have a classical repeater in the sense because, you know, you violate what is called no cloning theorem. So the information cannot be repeated. 
in a classical sense. So you need to, uh, you can have free space, but then the Earth's horizon becomes a problem because beyond the point you don't see each other, you don't have line of sight. So you need some out of the box thinking. One of them is this quantum repeater approach, as I said, which again we are working on, different ideas there, quantum teleportation. And then of course we have satellite based quantum communication where the satellite is enabling this communication between distant locations on the Earth. So this is what has been achieved. And you know, these are all the results uh, from the Mishia satellite, which is the only quantum satellite currently, which is, uh, you know, uh, commissioned. Uh, and these are all uh, achieved results. There's a lot more to do. In fact, an example of current state of the art, I will take through our own ongoing project, quantum experiments using satellite technology, which is our country's first approved project on satellite based secure quantum communications. You know, this is a collaboration between RRI and ISRO. Our aim is to establish information theoretically secure quantum communication over large distances, entanglement based QKD between two Indian ground stations using a satellite as a trusted node. And what we are trying to do is harder than what has already been done. We are trying to do what is called uplink based QKD. I won't go through the details, but this has never been done before. So if we succeed, it will be a global first. We have already achieved several global milestones and first uh, you know, several firsts from the Indian uh, context and we are looking forward to, you know, these things being done, satellite based QKD in the near future. I'll take an example of one of my papers here, which is in fact an in-lab experiment, demonstration of a certain protocol. This is India's first reported end to end free space QKD experiment, which has been published in an internationally peer reviewed journal. But what is important here is, you know, the key rate and the QBA, which are globally competitive. And remarkably, we have used, now I told you to remember one more thing, this physical random number generator. The same physical random number generator, which is photon on a beam splitter, as the Zeilinger experiment, which closed the locality loophole, that same concept we are using to increase security in this experiment. So all these things that these great people have established are being used very successfully in revolutionary uh, new ideas globally. And so this brings me to the last slide, you know, this is what summarizes this year's Nobel Prize, that today's science is tomorrow's technology. This was said in a different context, of course, but then this is what these Nobel laureates have done. They have laid the foundations for fundamental contributions to science, as well as the technology that has emerged from it. So the Nobel Prize is given both for the science and the technology that they have enabled. And of course, Anton Zeilinger continues to work on many of these technologies that we just uh, discussed. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Urbashi Sina. It was an excellent exposition of the work that brought the, these three uh, eminent scientists the Nobel Prize for in Physics for 2022. Equally, we're happy that you, know, you, are, the, you are the person with first-hand knowledge having been involved in several projects and uh, maybe some of the premier projects in the country, in India today. And uh, we couldn't have had a better person than you for telling us about the Nobel laureates in physics for 2022. The uh, kind much. of uh, slides that you had given us, the kind of explanations you gave us, the kind of uh, you know, the linkages that you provided between different areas uh, may was simply amazing. And uh, it made such an interesting uh, uh, listening and uh, we are so very grateful to you, Dr. Sina. Uh, no words adequate. Uh, immense thanks to you. We also have with us at this time the KSTA ST member, Professor A. H. Rajasab, the CEO of the Academy, Dr. A. M. Ramesh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Anand, Senior Scientific Officer, Signing Officers, Mr. Ramesh and Dr. Srinivas, all of them are with us the, apart from the audience. So. Uh, if you if you agree, a few minutes of uh, any remarks and uh, questions, comments that you know, our uh, audience might have. Is that is that okay? Absolutely, uh, I'm okay. happy to. Now, now it's the it's open to everyone. Uh, if you have any remark at this at this wonderful lecture and an excellent uh, piece of uh, information for all of us on the Nobel laureates physics 2022. Any comments, remarks, suggestions from our colleagues? Professor uh, Mulimani, sir, physicist is there. He has any remarks. Sir, Mulimani, sir. Oh. Hello.
Hello. Okay. So if there are no comments at this stage, I would like to thank uh, the listeners. As I said, uh, it's also on the YouTube, madam. A large number of people have been looking at it. It's a, I'm sure many of our colleagues from US mentioned that they are watching this. So thank you so much once again. And uh, we would, uh, at this stage, uh, 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 we would like to, as we go along, uh, listen to your work sometime. Wish you all the very best. Thank to you. Reach the, the, the heights, you know, that our uh, physicists have been doing that kind of work. You already gave uh, several hints at the work going on in your lab, the collaboration, the publications, several of them first for this country. So we are so proud and then uh, wish you all the best. We'll Thank you very much. Yeah. And then at this stage, over to Dr. M. Ramesh, the CEO of the KST. Dr. Ramesh, please. Professor Raja Sir, Sir, Davina Ramesh, we are not listening. Unmute, but unmute, unmute and speak. Please unmute. Raja Sir, Sir, unmute. Hello. Yeah, we can go further, Dr. Ramesh. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Madam Professor Urbasi Sinha, Professor RRI Bangalore delivered a very distinguished talk on the works of physics Nobel laureates 2022, uh, namely Professor Alan Aspect, Professor John Clauser, and uh, Professor Anton Zillinger. In fact, uh, it was a very issue. You explained in a very simple language. I am sure many non-physicists who are here, including me, could pick up some points from your talk. On behalf of KSTA and all the participants, we are very, very grateful to you, madam, for this very lucid and illuminating talk. As our honorable chairman told, we would like to work closely with RRI in popularizing science across the state in the coming days. Thank you very much once again. And uh, I take this opportunity to thank our honorable chairman, Professor Ayapan, sir, for initiating this lecture uh, series program. I'm also thankful to our esteemed members of KSTA, Professor Rajasab, sir, Professor Mutimani, sir, and uh, fellows of KSTA, Dr. Ram Krishna, uh, sir, for uh, being with us for this talk. Now, uh, in this novel series, we had three talks. Uh, first by Professor Rangnath sir, second by Dr. Ravindra Kodiyaldi, and there, this is the concluding talk on the uh, lecture series. On behalf of KSTA, I'm immensely thankful to all the resource persons for being with us and delivering very, very distinguished talks on the works of Nobel laureates. And I also take this opportunity to thank all the uh, participants who have joined us for this uh, uh, lecture series both on Cisco WebEx and the YouTube platform. Uh, we look forward to your support uh, in the future programs of KSTA as well. Thank you very much, ma'am. So once again, Mellarigu Matam Mellarigu Namaskara Gado. Nivella, this is the Nobel Laureate Lecture Series. Ki jai naik board dina. This then is Pune Samali ke liye Bhagwan Sidri, Karnataka Vijayan Sathya Nakhad Binda. Mellarigu Mellarigu Gado. And even today, na number two, I guess, Professor Bashi Sinha, uh, special thanks. Uh, we speak in Canada, madam. I'm sure you could make out now what we are trying to say. We are very grateful to everybody. Thank you very much. We'll be in touch. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Also, thankful to Dr. Krishna Prasad, who suggested madam's uh, name for delivering that, this talk. Thank you, Krishna Prasad sir, for suggesting a very, very distinguished and eminent scientist for this talk. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.